Imagine you're a child. A middle-aged child. A child from the Middle Ages. But you're not just any child. You're the son of Count Frederick Guggenberger I of the Zollangawa Westingham Robbenshire family line. Imagine you're told to behave your entire life, not to play in the dirt, always eat your veggies, whatever. And now you're sitting at this grand feast, in this festive palace halls, the halls of your uncle, King Louis of Zollangawa Westingham from Shire. So you're right next to your father and suddenly the cook brings in what can only be described as a neatly arranged mountain of solid sugar. My god, it's shaped like a swan, you mutter under your voice, wrestling another swan. How extravagant. It smells incredible, like nothing you've ever smelled before. The cook places it right in front of you. So, what do you do? My son, you are a disgrace to the entire Tolangawa Westingham Robbenshire family line. Another royal household, shattered by the sticky hands of an overcompetent confectioner. Welcome, friends. It's me, Steve, from Time Worn Stones. And as you've probably already guessed, I'm gonna show you today just what in the world cooks were thinking back then. Don't lie to me. I know what you would do. Because I know what I would do. I would destroy that banquet harder than a trebuchet a castle wall. So if you think you've had it hard staying on that no Oreo diet of yours, <laughs> you should see what nobility had to abstain from back then to fit into their corsets, um, neck collars, uh, whatever. You know, sugar has always been kind of the bee's knees regarding the curious goods. You must understand that if sugar was something even more than sweet tasting and life shortening, then it was expensive. From the Romans to medieval England, it was treated as an elusive medicine of sorts to cure scurvy, headaches, make cough syrup and Pretty much everything you can imagine. No, really, I mean it. Maybe they dumped it into everything because it just made it taste better. This notion only really changed at the beginning of the 16th century, when advances in refining and the discovery of fake India made sugar prices drop dramatically. It was still considered a fanciful upper crust break spice though. But it no longer had the same level of bragginess it once had. Sounds like a problem, if you're rich. But hey, we need to think logical here. Nowadays, what would a, say, well-heeled member of society do if he got bored of his Lamborghini collection? That's right, he'd just buy some more. And that's what they did too. And where would a European aristocrat shop other? than at our favorite monopoly holding powerhouse, Venice. They had so much of it in fact, people there started putting it somewhere else than into their anti-malaria potions. Yes, they put it into their kitchens, mmm, yummy. King Henry III's visit to Venice gets my medal for sweetest prank in all of history, when they arranged a banquet for him and I quote, Taking the napkin in hand, it broke into two pieces, one of which fell to the ground. In fact, tablecloths, plates, cutlery, everything on the table was made of sugar. So similar to true to deceive anyone. And that was on top of all the sugary statues they cooked up for the occasion as well. Some really funny folks, those Venetians, spending tax money and holding trade monopolies just to flex on the French king. Now, you are a freshly baked renaissance rich man with barrels of sugar just chilling in your palace granary and you recently found out you can use this stuff for cooking. As you can probably guess, I want you to make a connection to 
gigantic freaking cakes. And I don't mean your boring old regular birthday cake or whatever. No, this is a royal banquet we're talking about. And that means you had two things to prove, status and wealth. So for you to impress your guests, that also meant two things, sugar and tons of it. Great banquets were held, containing desserts made with ornate detail and a grandeur to perfectly complement the Baroque architecture popular at the time. British monarchs were especially fond of sugary delights for some reason. Queen Elizabeth I was said to have blackened teeth, a side effect apparently of extensive sugar consumption. Or maybe a prank by her royal court gone wrong? Who knows? In the late 1600s, writings by Robert May, a royal cook from Britain, describes a sugar stag that bleeds claret wine when an arrow is removed from its flank, a sugar castle that fires its artillery at a man of war, and gilded sugar pies filled with live birds. Ha, <laughs> that gives tasteful a whole new meaning. Oh, and take a look at this image by the way. It's an illustration from the 15th century of a royal banquet hosted by Richard II, then King of England. It's painted at the most exciting moment when the servant walks into the room and carries a ship to the table, made entirely of sugar, a subtlety as they were also called by the way. You know, servant placed it, they watched it, they devoured it like a pack of rabbit dogs and on to the next course. So if you were genealogically gifted so to speak, you could get everything you oh so desired. From small castles to heroic figures, it didn't matter. Want to show off how literate you were? Table filled with every god from the Olymp. Need a display piece for your funeral feast? How about a giant replica of the deceased person's head? Ha! <laughs> that gives tasteful a whole new uh, oh wait, I already made that joke. But for that, people had to be hired, who knew how to handle the malleable, sticky sugar paste and actually turn it into a sculpture, you know, that resembles stuff. And with that, the confectioner was born. Ah, beautiful. And they certainly had a lot to do back then, cause nobility started to pump out requests for their desserts left and right and center. Whole ideable worlds were sometimes created for a single feast, complete with miniature temples, sugar-coated roasts and glazed fruits hanging from trees. You might call that decadent, but hey, who doesn't want to impress the dinner guests with amazing party decorations? And guests were sometimes even invited to break off pieces and take them home as souvenirs. And so countless confectioners continued to melt, press, cast and spin their way into the cholesterol riddled hearts of every aristocrat there was. Back then, if you could make half a decent elephant out of marzipan, you were pretty much an artist through and through. No joke though. Dessert specialists in the 18th century and beyond needed to understand architecture and structural design and might even have had to look up the real thing beforehand in order to be capable of replicating it all in sugar paste and frosting. And then you have me, who can't even make a gingerbread house stand on its own without resorting to half a bottle of superglue. Monarchs made sure to only hire the best chefs who could make them the tallest, grandest and most eye-catching table fillers possible. There's an account written by John Wright, in which the Earl of Castlemaine hosted a grand feast for his favorite Italian Pope, Pope Innocent XI. There was this long table and on it, he wrote, were a range of historical figures, almost half as big as life, made of a kind of sugar paste, but modeled to the utmost skill of statuary. It was so precious the Pope had it watched by the Stop Swiss right guard there, before scout. the feast Nobody even began. <laughs> and that's not even a meal fit for a king. Check that one out. When Charles VI was crowned 
Holy Roman Emperor back in 1711. There was a great celebration with even greater delicacies and all attendees must have known that a master confectioner went to burn out therapy the day after cause a local wrote the following words about the coronation feast. On her majesty's table was a show dinner several stories high consisting of columns with a garnish of pyramids and gilded spheres. Below were green festoons on which crowned imperial eagles could be seen holding the golden fleece. In the middle was Jason who made the dragon asleep and killed it. Believe me, guests will get a heart attack when they'll have this bad boy slept on their dinner plates. No, really, I mean like literally. So anyways, another example of a royal diabetes, diabetes. speedrun was that time Peter the Great was born. His parents must have known that he will be, well, great one day. So they held a spectacular celebration in his honor. <clears throat> Large molded sugar confections shaped like eagles with the royal orb, each weighing over 50 pounds, a 72 pound swan and many other birds, a sugar kremlin with infantry, cavalry and two towers, the city molded into a square surrounded by cannons, large 15 pound horns flavored with cinnamon, infantry, cavalry and other figures too. <gasps> yeah. So it was a lot. Sometimes even simple peasants like you and me were allowed to join in. Most often at the end of it though, so some bellyful patricians could watch as the leftovers from dessert were picked apart by a mob of hungry townsfolk. Well, I hope that they got a good laugh at least, watching Francois get clapped with a pasty ledge replica of Apollo's left foot because he wanted a chunk of that almond laced Greek temple. I also found this engraving of a banquet served at the Duke of Julig's wedding in 1587. Seems like one enormous subtlety wasn't enough for his highness ego, so the duke had an entire table filled with sugar figurines. There was a forest of trees, animals and even his coat of arms was served at the table. Madman had a replica of his own castle erected and just for the heck of it. I'd like to sit at a corner, please. As the 1700s came to an end, one of the most famous average opulence enjoyers rose to fame. Marie Antoine Karim. Born in the later 17th century, Karim had studied architecture and loved nothing more than good old French cuisine. He knew sugar in and out, spent hours crafting blueprints for his famous Pierce Monte to satisfy his countless royal beneficiaries. Just look, beautiful, stunning, ach oh, delicious, well maybe delicious, I don't really like sugary foods. One of his greatest works must have been the cake he made for Napoleon and his wife when their son got baptized, a huge Venetian gondola colored entirely in blue. Try to visualize that the next time you call your half-eaten Snickers bar from the back of your car a dessert. Banquets were pretty big and expensive for a couple of centuries, until further decrease in sugar prices and a couple of revolts made it kinda wack to spend a quarter of your empire's GDP on lavish meals alone, except for a few dishes like the French Croquembouche, which is still made today for special occasions or if you won the lottery and don't know what food to buy anymore. And if you know any other huge desserts still made today, leave it in the comments, alright? I think there's no better quote to sum it all up than one from the man Grand Chef Karim himself. Architecture is the most noble of arts and pastry the highest form of architecture. Couldn't have said it better myself. I bet you got hungry now. That's all from me today. Servus und Baba.